Good morning. Welcome to Common Grounds Church at Home Service. My name is Michelle Pauls and I am part of the Common Ground Service at Butler Church. And wherever you are, uh, we are just glad that you are here with us today. I know that we probably all wish we could be together in person, um, but until that can happen, we are just glad that you've come to this time and this place to be with us. And with that in mind, I invite you to think about the place that you are in and the space that you are in and anything that might be a distraction to you during this time. Maybe um, if you have your cell phone nearby, turn it off or set it to airplane mode or if there's um, noise or distraction coming from another part of the house, close the door. Just get yourself into a place and a space where um, this can be some sacred time where we can hear from the Lord and um, just come together to worship him. We're gonna be continuing in the series that Pastor Scott has been leading us through on the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter five. So maybe one thing you wanna do is grab your Bible if it's not already nearby and make sure that you have that so that when we get to the sermon, you'll be able to um, open the word and read along as we go. We just hope that this morning you leave this service feeling encouraged and equipped and challenged and that God would have a special word for each one of us that we need to hear this morning. So would you join me as um, we open this service with a word of prayer? Father God, we are so grateful that um, even in the midst of a time when we can't be together in person, we have the means to still come together and worship you, God. We just pray for the service that is um, unfolding before us and ask that your hand would be upon each element, Lord, and that your words and your um, will would be done through this, God, that you would speak to each one of us through the word, through the worship and song, um, through the prayer time, Lord, and just uh, give each one of us the thing that you would have us here this week. We just pray that um, you would be with us all, free us from distraction, help us to come and enter fully into worship in this time and this place. In Jesus' name, amen. Please uh, join us now as Chris leads us in some worship and song. Well, good morning again, Butler Church. I'm glad you're joining us. Church at home again this week. I hope you're ready to, uh, to worship with us this morning. We worship a wonderful God, a powerful God, a God that again is, is somebody that has created everything around us, a beautiful God. So I just invite you to, uh, to, to find a place that, that feels comfortable to, to engage in worship, if that's standing, if that's kneeling, if that's sitting, however you feel like you best engage with your father this morning. Would you would you do that with these, with me this morning as we sing together? So let's sing. Wonderful, so wonderful. Wonderful, so wonderful. It's your unfailing love. Spoken mercy over me. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no heart can fully know. Glorious, the beautiful. Oh 
wonders anew He captured my heart with His love Cause nothing on earth is as beautiful as You and You opened my eyes to Your wonders anew He captured my heart with His love Cause nothing on earth is as beautiful with this love cause nothing on earth is as beautiful as you hello butler church it is great to be able to worship together again this morning this weekend and I'm recording this a couple of days early, and it made me think about how these days are so strange that I don't know what's going to have happened before Sunday, um, because from one day to the next these days, it feels like you just don't know. And yet, um, I read this week in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8, that says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. And I'm so grateful that whatever we pray, whatever I pray today on Sunday, um, we know we can agree with because we know that we're praying in agreement with God's will. And we know that, um, that Jesus doesn't change <laughs> between now and Sunday. And a year from now, um, he's going to be the same. So let's come before God with our requests for this week. Father God, in the name of Jesus Christ, by the Holy Spirit, we come to you and we thank you that you are unchanging, that in this world that is shifting sand, both in belief and in current events, God, we do not know what is coming down the road, but you do, and we know that you are the same you do not change. Your word remains the same. And just like Pastor Scott is going to be sharing this morning, God, your truth is unchanging. And I thank you, Lord, that we can stand firmly on your truth and let your truth fill our lives. I pray that we would do that, God. That we would allow your word and your truth to saturate our thoughts more than anything else, more than the news more than any other, um, anybody else's ideas, God, more than social media, that we would allow your truth and your word to direct our thoughts and our steps. God, I pray this week, especially for, um, for Maria as she continues her cancer treatment. Father God, we ask that you would pour out blessings of healing and strength and provision on her and her family. Lord, help her to know how loved she is by you and by the rest of us. And we just ask that you will continue to give the doctors wisdom that her body will respond to the treatments and that you will just carry her through this time. God, encourage her and protect her. And Lord, we pray for our city that and our county, our state, Lord, our country, this world, that the number of um, COVID-19 cases would go down instead of going up so quickly, 
and that you would just give us all wisdom and guidance, Lord, to know what our part is, but um, also that we would be able to walk by faith and not in fear. And we just ask God for your hand over our city and the leaders and each one of us that um, is living here. God, help us and keep us healthy. We ask just, yeah, that you would sustain us and be with us. And Lord, I uh, we pray for just that we would all continue to grow in you, Lord, that our faith would be based on truth, that we'd walk by faith and not by sight, and that um, we would continue to grow in dependence on you, Lord. We celebrate our country's independence this weekend, but Lord, I pray that we would grow deeper and deeper in dependence on you because that is what you want. And I ask that in your name, Jesus, by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
sing with me how great is our God. All will see how great, how great is our God. Today's message, we're, we're going to be diving into Matthew chapter 5, verse 17 and following. So I want to encourage you to, to be opening your Bibles there. And as you do, I, I've got a question for you. Do you have rules in your house? Do you have house rules? Do you ever say anything like, well, in our house, this is what we do. Or in our house, we don't. As parents, we, we say things like that. And, and maybe sometimes we, we give and pass down to our children commandments. You will clean your room is a commandment that is often shared in the Holman house and is often one that is grumbled about and challenged in different ways. But you would say, why, why do you have that commandment? If, if you looked in, in our kids' rooms, as most kids' rooms can, at times you, you open the door and you want to close it immediately because you don't know what is going on in there. You don't know what is growing in there. And so we make this commandment. We tell our children, you will clean your room. It is rule, it is law, it is what will be done in this home. And, <clears throat> and we, we ask them to do that, but could you imagine uh, if my kids or any child responded to this uh, in the way that we sometimes respond to the word of God and the commandments of God even, what, what God has, has set out in scripture for his people to do or not to do. I think it's Francis Chan that, that gave this example and, and I'll borrow it from him is, uh, he says, imagine telling your child that you, you will clean your room and for your child to say, okay, and to disappear into their room. And for some time, maybe even hours later, uh, to reappear and to come out and to say, Father, I have been studying your commandment, your word. Uh, and I've actually do dove deep into the Hebrew, the original source of the language and definitions of the words. And, and we've discovered even within that statement, you will clean your room. Uh, we've studied the word your. And your is a word which, which implies possession, which implies ownership. And we counter that with the fact that I am a child and a child cannot own or, or purchase. And in fact, my name is not on the deed of the property and I do not own the room. And so therefore, I, I do not think this commandment is necessarily written or spoken to me, but, but it is a commandment nonetheless. And so I ask, Father, that by your will and your way that this room would be clean. Uh, that your purposes would be served and your commandments obeyed, uh, but somehow that would happen with someone other than myself. And of course, that's kind of a silly way of playing it out, but how often do we perhaps read the scriptures, uh, read the word of God and, and study it and parse it and, and learn the meanings of words and, and meanings of scripture only on a certain plane, only from a certain perspective and, and miss the depth of what God's intention was for even originally placing a commandment or, re, or, or, or a, a prerogative, a, a commandment to go or a commandment to stop and to withhold, to, to fail to consider that, that God has a deeper purpose in mind for that. That he doesn't desire for us to parse the, the meanings in every, every minutia of detail, uh, but to actually understand the, the spirit behind what he's asking us to do. As a parent, I ask my child to clean a room, not not for, for, for them to learn to check a list, but for them to learn to appreciate uh, cleanliness, to they themselves live clean uh, and, 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 and hygienic ways to, to learn responsibility and discipline that can play itself out in so many other facets of life. There's a depth to that that's missed if, if they only study that commandment as, as a statement to be pulled apart. And today we want to dive into God's word and, and to hear something from Jesus in which he, he kind of pulls at the same strings here, the same ideas, uh, and expresses why he came, why Jesus came and, and what it, it, he meant when, when he said certain things. And so if you found Matthew chapter 5, verse 17, we're going to pick up the story there as he's preaching this, what we call the Sermon on the Mount. And he says this to the people on, on that mountain. Don't misunderstand why I have come. I did not come to abolish the law of Moses or the writings of the prophets. No, I came to accomplish their purpose. I tell you the truth. Until, every, until heaven and earth disappear, not even the smallest detail of God's law will disappear until its purpose is achieved. So already 
Jesus uh, has maybe been hearing questions about his ministry, about what his motives are and what he's trying to accomplish. And he says, don't misunderstand. Perhaps people had already been sharing some false narratives about, about what he was doing and, 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 and what he was teaching. And he says to them, don't misunderstand. I have not come to end the Old Testament laws and, and rules. He talks about Moses and the prophets. He says, I, I didn't come to end that, but to accomplish their purpose. And in other translations, it says to fulfill the law. Jesus says, I, I didn't come to put it away. I came to, to accomplish it. And even if you go to the original language, if we study it, it says, I came to, to fill it up. I came to give it new depth and new meaning, a meaning that perhaps had been missed for generations and generations of God's people. He says, I'm not throwing out the Bible. I'm not restarting fresh. God didn't say, wait, that didn't work. Let's do a different thing. He's saying, I came to fill in the blanks. I came to help you understand more fully what God's intentions are, his good and perfect will and way for your life. Jesus comes to the people and he answers the question, this is what I'm here for. This is what I'm here to do. Jesus is saying, I came to fill up the Old Testament scriptures. What does that mean? It's kind of like getting, um, have you ever gotten instructions to build something? If you've ever gone to Ikea and bought something, brought it home, you opened up this page of instructions and it's a series of pictures and, and really hard to, to figure out and, and it may be hard to discern and, and, and you're not sure how to do it. And so it, it's, it's difficult. So maybe today you might, you might turn to YouTube and say, wait a minute, I'm just going to go watch a video to see how to do this because the instructions flat on the page just don't make sense to me. And so you go and watch a video. And so now it, it starts to make sense as somebody actually physically grabs the piece and you see, oh, that screw goes, oh, it goes there. You turn it this direction, you, you gain a perspective and it, and it goes from a two-dimensional piece of, of instruction to all of a sudden this three-dimensional image of, of what's supposed to happen and how this bookcase or whatever you're assembling is supposed to go together. In a sense, Jesus is saying, I've, I've come to, to help you decipher the instructions that are in front of you in God's word and, and to bring some depth, almost moving from paper to, to video, to say, I, now I'm gonna give you some depth to go, wait a minute, there's, this is how this all fits together. This is where God is intending for things to go. Jesus is saying he, he came to fulfill all of this and he could live out God's instruction in the perfect way but he could also bring a depth and fill in some of the blanks to help us understand how to follow along in his footsteps. Jesus says, I came to bring a fuller understanding of what God has designed and purposed all along, from Genesis all the way to Jesus, and for us today, all the way through Revelation, Jesus came to, to be a continuation of what God's will and way is. And Jesus is all about living out God's will and way for us. That's what Jesus is about. That's why he came. But what about us? What are we to do? If we continue to read in Matthew 5 and 19, Jesus turns the spotlight from himself to us, his followers. He says in verse 19, so if you ignore the least commandment and teach others to do the same, you will be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But anyone who obeys God's laws and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. But I warn you, Unless your righteousness is better than the righteousness of the teachers of religious law and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Jesus says very clearly that, that if you're his follower, you are to follow God's law, his will and his way, his revealed instruction is another way of, of, of saying that word law or Torah. Uh, it, it's God's revealed instruction and, and you're to follow it as a follower of God, a follower of Jesus. We're to live according to God's will and his way. And it's an all-in proposition. Jesus says it's, it's not that we can take some parts and leave others to the side or tell other people to do the same thing. It's, it's for us to, to absorb the whole thing. God, God brought us the whole package. He reveals to us the whole way to the fullest, greatest, grandest, most amazing life. And, and God's given it to us in his word and he's giving us now in Jesus. 
He says it, it, all of it is a complete package. You can't just take part. If we go back to the example of instructions, you can't just say, well, I'm going to skip steps 6, 9, and 12 because they don't make sense to me, or I find them too difficult, or perhaps they don't apply to my bookcase that I'm assembling. You, you could do that, and, and perhaps you can even make something look and, and, and behave almost completely functional uh, to its original intent, but we know that if you skip steps and you end up with some parts left over, eventually the, what you've assembled is, is not going to last. It's going to fall apart. And Jesus in, is in fact calling his people to, to be committed to following through on God's will and God's way, his instruction, his law. He's telling his people, in fact, to be committed and to be even more obedient and more committed to God's instruction than they already are. He even warns them, he says, you'll need to have a better righteousness than the teachers of religious law and the Pharisees. Otherwise, you won't enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, that sounds like a really kind of wild statement from Jesus. Uh, and, and for them, those that heard this message originally, they would have really been blown out of the water on this because they saw the teachers of that day and the Pharisees specifically, they were the gold standard of obedience to God's rules, to obeying the rules. They were quite proud of it, actually. They, they were admired in public for that. They, were, they, they loved how they could check all the boxes. They would pray multiple times a day according to Scripture, check. They would give their offering and make sure everyone saw it. Check. They didn't work on the Sabbath. They obeyed all the rules to the letter of the law. Check. I mean, if there were, if there were 300 rules to obey in a day, the, the Pharisees and the teachers, the experts, they, they would get you know, 275 or more, whereas the average person maybe is hovering around 150 or less. And Jesus says, no, you got to be better. You have a better righteousness than the Pharisees and, and the experts. What does he mean by better? Well, I think when we hear better, we might automatically think we, we think more. So if the Pharisees were able to accomplish 275 out of 300, we, we should be aiming for 290 checked boxes, rules obeyed, uh, things that we've followed through. And, and, and I would argue that Jesus is not, it's not the point of what Jesus means when he says, we need to have a better righteousness. So the Pharisees were great at checking boxes, but they were also experts at missing the point. Let me give you an example. When it came to observing the Sabbath, a commandment, it included rules later on as scripture came along. There were, there were different rules or, or, or be, uh, understandings of what it meant not to work. And one of those was a limit on travel. You were to only travel a certain number of cubits, a measure. So to say, maybe you're not supposed to travel more than half a mile on the Sabbath. You're supposed to rest. Well, the experts determined, uh, as they read and interpreted scripture, and the Pharisees even came up with this idea that, well, what is home? Well, first they said, well, maybe home is not just your house, but it's the walls of the city that's your home. So maybe it's a half a mile from there. Still other, a later interpretation was, well, home is where you eat. So if you prepared some food uh, that was even a half a mile out, so you could travel half a mile, uh, and there you had food ready to be prepared, that would be home now because you're eating there. And you could still travel yet another half a mile uh, in that a direction further. So now you could travel a mile and still be obeying, checking the box, I honored the Sabbath. It's not exactly what God had in mind when he said, you will honor the Sabbath. God and Jesus are not concerned with whether we can check the box, did it, but that we can fully live and fully embrace God's will and his way, a way that actually leads to better life, a blessed life, we might say. But better is, is not always the same as more. It's not always about quantity as much as it's about quality. It's about going deeper than surface level. It's about embracing a deep depth of satisfaction that comes from, from honoring God and, and the full intent of what he's asking us and calling us to do or not to do. 
It's no wonder that, that Jesus uh, later would, would call the Pharisees whitewashed tombs. He said, you're, you have this beauty on the outside, but inside you're filled with death and rot and decay. On the, on the outside, you're checking all the boxes, doing all the rules, but on the inside, you're missing the point. We might want more examples and, and, and to understand this a little bit further and unpack some of the commandments. And, and in fact, Jesus is going to do that as we continue to read in Matthew 5. But for today, we're going we're gonna to stop here. And consider what it means to follow Jesus and to live according to the will and the way of God. And and what it means to, to read and absorb scripture from the point of view of Jesus. And so today I want to challenge you. As we consider Matthew 5 and, and these verses that we've looked at. I want us to consider what it means to pursue going deep with God. Let's go deep with God. Let's not be satisfied to remain on the surface, to let our faith remain a series of do's and don'ts, but but to dive deeper behind God's word and his commandments and his instruction and to say, God, well, maybe let's ask the question more often, why? God, you've asked me to be pure in my actions and and pure in my speech. Why? Why are you asking me that? What is the reason that you would ask me to go there or not go in other places? Why is Jesus saying this? Why is God commanding this? Let's, let's go into the word of God and ask the question, why? why? What is God's intention? And we don't know those always necessarily right off the bat. And so we need to ask that question of each other and of our teachers and, and those around us who are following Jesus with us. Let's say, God... Let's say to others, why, why is God saying this? Why are we doing this? Perhaps in asking the question, we'll find that, that we are on the right track. Or maybe we're not. Maybe we're missing the point and it's good to course correct and to learn and to move forward with God and according to his will and way. Secondly, I, I want us to, to dive into God's word and to read God's word through the lens of Jesus. Jesus is our most vivid and accurate, dynamic vision of who God is. It is the, the, the most direct revelation of who God is. God's word reveals who God is. Uh, his spirit in others and active in others is, is who God is and, and how he operates. And in Jesus, we see most perfectly and most, most maybe without any, any barrier, we see who God is. Jesus is, is not a different than God. He, he is God. And the God of the Old Testament is, is the God found in Jesus in the New Testament. And so as we read the Word of God, I want to encourage us to continually read it from, from the lens and through the lens of Jesus. And we want to read Old and New Testament. We want to, we want to read the Word of God and to understand it through the lens of, of who Jesus is and what Jesus has done uh, in his life, in his death, and in his resurrection. And finally, I want to encourage us to live under grace. Jesus did accomplish God's law, his instruction, his way perfectly. He was without sin, scripture tells us. He he did what none of us can do on our own. He, He literally checked all the boxes. He lived a perfect life. But he didn't do it just on the surface. He provided us with a depth of understanding of what that life is all about. One of the major components of that depth is love. From his great love, he he lived a perfect life and yet still was willing to suffer the consequences of living an imperfect life, of living a sinful life, a life that is not oriented towards God's will and way. He took on our punishment. He took on sin and death and its effects. And he broke their power because he resurrected. He didn't stay dead. Sin could not win. Death could not win. Because Jesus overcame. And because he's done this, because he's broken the power of sin and death, he is alive today and able to give us and share with us his righteousness. He imparts it to us as we have faith. And as we struggle, as we fail, 
as we mess up, God is willing, he, Jesus is willing to say, come, confess, repent, go the other direction. I, I have grace, I have mercy for you. And I want to encourage us to live in that grace and that mercy. To not be consumed by, by living by the rules and the regulations, but to instead be passionate about living deeply, powerfully, with great love and grace, the life that Jesus has demonstrated for us. May we follow Jesus fully and in that experience the fullness of God, the fullness of life. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your word and we thank you for the encouragement it is to know that from the very beginning you have pursued us. From the garden to the grave, God, and, and, and from the grave to resurrection and, and to the day of your return, Jesus, we we see that you have pursued us, you have loved us, you have desired the very best for us. God, may we recognize that. May we, may we be willing to pursue and understand that more and more. May we understand the depth at which you love us, the depth at which you've called us to live. Lord, that you desire us not to be just merely rule followers, but, but to be life givers, to live a fullness and depth of life that not only fills us up, but overflows into others, God. May we live this, this life that you came to show us and reveal to us and extend to us. God, this week, may we live deeply, more deeply than we did the week before. And the week after that and the week after that, God, may we continue to go deeper. May, we, may our understanding go deeper. But we'll never reach it, a full understanding. May we know that you are with us, your grace fills us. God, your power leads us and guides us. So God, we trust you, we give you our lives, and we invite you to bring about your will and your way in us. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you again for joining us for Common Ground Church at Home. We're so glad you joined us, and we'll see you again soon.